Good morning. Oh. Good morning. Uh, we start today's business with general questions and question number one from John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with trade unions, public body, social enterprises and businesses regarding Scotland's immigration needs. Minister Alistair Allen. Migration is crucial to Scotland's economic prospects and demographic sustainability and the Scottish Government has met with and seen evidence from a range of individuals and organisations on Scotland's current and future needs. In November we set out the evidence about the importance of migration to Scotland in our submission to the Migration Advisory Committee uh, we, and in that we followed the earlier this year with uh, a discussion paper on Scotland's population growth and migration policy showing how a tailored approach to migration for Scotland with new powers for the Scottish Parliament could work. The Scottish Government shares the concerns of these bodies about the risks of both the UK leaving the EU and the hostile environment immigration policy pursued by the UK Government. The development of both the MEC submission and our discussion paper involved close engagement with key stakeholders in Scotland and we are continuing to engage with partners to build consensus across the political spectrum and wider civic society. John Finney. I thank the Minister for that detailed and uh, uh, very welcome response. Uh, the Minister will be aware, indeed it's in his own constituency, of a Channel 4 news report recently about the challenges connected with the fishing industry in Barra. We also have the situation of the, the Canadian teacher refused a visa by the Home Office, threatening the provision of Gaelic medium education on Mull. Uh, the NHS and tourism are important sectors and we want to, to welcome people to support our communities. The, the Tories' hostile environment uh, policy simply doesn't uh, uh, apply, help Scotland at all. I wonder will the Minister consider reconvening the cross-party ministerial working group, which in the last session secured support on a cross-party basis to reinstate the post-study visa and broaden its remit to addressing this pressing matter, please? Minister. A couple of the uh, sensible issues, various, all of them sensible issues that the member uh, mentions there. Uh, on the issue of the, the teacher uh, who was <coughs> seeking to come to, uh, uh, to work in Argyll and Butte and was denied the opportunity so to do, one of the, the problems behind this and other examples of its kind are that with, uh, at the moment, the sixth month in a row where the UK government has put a, a cap on the number of visas for people coming in to do just these kind of jobs, uh, we're now seeing uh, no jobs being made available uh, for people below a £50,000 a year uh, salary. And that's, that's why teachers and others have fallen into this, this situation. On fishing, uh, the member will be uh, very aware that uh, fishing has not featured highly in the, the UK government's approach to the Brexit talks and has not been high on their list of priorities with, with consequences for everyone. And in terms of cross-party working, I'm very happy to work with the member and others across the spectrum to ensure that we address these and other issues around Brexit. Question number two, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what powers it has to enact a Crown Use Licence to allow the production of biosimilar versions of the breast cancer treatment Pergetta and drugs for other conditions. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. The Scottish Government has the power to apply for a Crown Use Licence, but we do not consider that invoking this power would provide a quick solution to providing this medicine for patients in Scotland. This is because a, an alternative manufacturer would have to go through a lengthy process of obtaining regulatory approval from either the European's Medicine Agency or the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency before it could make a submission to the Scottish Medicines Consortium. The manufacturer of Pergetta Roche uh, has held discussions with NHS National Procurement and I expect that dialogue to continue in order that Roche can bring forward a new submission to the SMC for their consideration. Alison Johnson. I thank you. The campaign body Just Treatment state in their briefing on this issue that the key driver of the price is the patent-backed monopoly. Um, breast cancer patients are urging us all to ensure they can access the treatment they need. And I'm delighted to hear that the manufacturers of Perchetta are in discussion. They need to make an urgent resubmission at a reduced price to the SMC, but we shouldn't rule out any legal mechanism or procurement possibility that would help these patients. In Italy, just the prospect of a compulsory licence being enacted helps reduce the price of a hepatitis C medicine. So what lessons is the Scottish government learning from other countries regarding access to medicine and drug prices? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, we will always uh, look at learning lessons from, from other countries. Uh, but as I 
laid out to Alison Johnson that the process that would be required is not a straightforward one. And she makes the point about uh, patients getting access to the treatment they need as quickly as possible. Now, as I said in my initial answer, Roche uh, is uh, in discussion uh, with NHS National Procurement and uh, that dialogue uh, continues. Um, I would urge them to bring forward a, a new submission to the SMC for their consideration. Obviously, the timing of that is with the company, but I would urge them to do that as quickly as possible. And indeed, Alison Johnson is right that that should be at a fair price. That is what we would expect from any uh, com uh, pharmaceutical company bringing forward a, a product. And we hope they'll do that as quickly as possible. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned that NHS National Procurement and the manufacturer of Roche are actually in a discussion at this moment. Can she say when decision on that offer will actually be due uh, to ministers and to SMC? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, ministers don't have any involvement uh, in the process for good reason. I mean, it really, uh, we have a, a process established under the, the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Uh, that is independent of ministers and that is quite right and of course it's important that all or get all companies follow that process however the the role of NHS national procurement has been to help to have that discussion in order to uh, ensure that the submission well first of all that the company is is encouraged to make a submission but that that submission is as good a submission as it can possibly be but they do require to go to SMC and again as I said to Alison Johnson I would urge them uh, to do that as quickly as possible but to do that with a fair price offer and Elaine Smith Thank you, President Officer. Given the number of women suffering, suffering from an underactive thyroid who have to buy desiccated thyroid hormone on the internet from other countries in order to simply function in their day-to-day -day lives, and also the price of the alternative possibility of T3, would the Minister consider exploring the possibility of the Scottish Government enacting a Crown Use Licence to allow the production of desiccated thyroid hormone in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as a I think I've written to Elaine Smith on a number of occasions about this particular issue. Uh, obviously, um, the clinical need of the patient uh, is important, and obviously clinicians do have the opportunity to use other medicines where the patient would not be clinically appropriate uh, for, um, for the, the, the normal uh, medicine that would be used for, uh, for thyroid uh, problems. But again, I'm happy to, to write to Elaine Smith uh, on that issue in more detail, but um, at, the, at the core of this, is that we have a system which has been um, reformed on a number of occasions. The Montgomery recommendations uh, are being implemented now and which will make sure that the Scottish system for the approval of medicines is, uh, continues to be robust and fair. Question number three, Ruth Maguire. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making towards delivering the carer's allowance supplement. Minister Jean Freeman. Carers Allowance Supplement is a 13% increase to Carers Allowance to be uprated in line with inflation in future years. This overall investment of more than 30 million a year benefits 70,000 carers. We are on track to make the first of the six monthly payments later this summer, despite the Department of Work and Pensions delay in providing us with the full set of data agreed for the delivery of the supplement. Ruth McGuire. It's clearly of concern that the UK Government are not providing all the information that the Scottish Government need for this supplement. Does the Minister think that the UK Government are putting Scotland's needs at the bottom of their to-do list? Minister. I thank the member for the supplementary. As members across this chamber, I hope by now, realise and understand we are entirely reliant on the DWP to provide the data we need. This is basic data, name, uh, address, national insurance number, bank account details for all of the 11 benefits that will be devolved. In the, in the case of uh, this supplement, we agreed the data requirements with the DWP on the 9th of March. Ten days later, they advised us that there were data sets in that agreement they could not provide. This is the third time since March that this has happened with the DWP. Firstly, their summary announcement of a one-year delay in the agreement to abolish bedroom tax at source and provide us with the uh, delivery mechanism to do that. 
Next, the four-month delay in providing us with the computer code necessary uh, to deliver on the case management system. And now this. The Scottish Government, as Audit Scotland recognises, remains on track but we absolutely need the DWP to step up to the pace. And what that requires, First Minister, is for the Secretary of State, Esther McVeigh, to show the leadership that this government shows in making sure that the delivery of these devolved benefits happens on time to the right people and in the right way. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I think it's disappointing that the Secretary of State is not living up to the spirit of her comments. Um, that she made at the recent Social Security Committee. But can I ask the Minister to say, if the DWP fail to provide full data, that if a carer presents themselves and evidence that they receive carer's allowance to the new agency, that the agency will then be in a position to pay them the new supplement? Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Griffin for that question. It is an important one. I, I would say, before I answer it in full, that it is, of course, disappointing, and I'd urge Mr Griffin to work with my colleagues in Westminster to continue to press at Westminster that Secretary of State to deliver on the assurances that we've repeatedly had from her and from her four predecessors to honour the devolution settlement and make sure that we work cooperatively together. Officials do a very good job, but we need political leadership. In terms of those who may be affected by the absence of these data sets, we are working very closely with the carers organisations involved to ensure that they help us reach all of those who have that entitlement. We will work very carefully to make sure that all carers understand what they are entitled to, and if they don't receive that from us in that first six monthly payment that they contact us and when they do we will most certainly honour that commitment. Where that doesn't happen in that they don't know or they haven't been reached by our information and don't appreciate that they, are, that they are due that money, then in the second six monthly payment we will backdate that to ensure that they receive the full year's amount along with all the other carers in Scotland. Thank you. Question number four, Alexander Burnett. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to ambulance services. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. As one of our national NHS boards, the Scottish Government provides governance and annual funding to the Scottish Ambulance Service to provide high quality emergency health care to the people of Scotland. We've invested almost £900 million in the ambulance service over the last four years and are committed to supporting the service in recruiting and training 1,000 new paramedics to work in the community by 2021. Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank uh, my fellow member Liam MacArthur on bringing his motion to Parliament supporting a second charity air ambulance to be based in Aberdeen. Uh, so will the Minister also support the Press and Journal's campaign which is looking to assist the charity to achieve their aims in order to benefit the whole of the north of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I uh, say that Scotland's uh, charity air ambulance carries out fantastic uh, work throughout Scotland helping to save and improve lives every day and a second helicopter will allow uh, the SCAA to further support the Scottish Ambulance Service in saving even more lives and this will be particularly helpful in the more remote and rural areas of Scotland and it will also be extremely valuable in support of the Scottish Trauma Network Vision and our plans to take care uh, to the patient. So the answer is yes. Question number five, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Inspectorate of Prosecution in Scotland's recent report on victims' right to review and complaints handling and feedback. Lord Advocate James Wolfe. Uh, the victims' right to review gives victims a right to request a review of decisions not to initiate or to discontinue prosecutions. I welcome the Inspectorate of Prosecution's uh, report, uh, which recognises <laughs> that the VRR process, the victims' right to review process, is a robust one. Uh, the Inspectorate has made 11 recommendations which echo work that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service has been undertaking uh, internally on the victim's right to uh, review. I've accepted all of those recommendations. On complaints handling, the report recognises a more user-friendly complaints handling process and improvements in the quality of the services responses following the Inspectorate's 2015 report on complaints handling. The Inspectorate has rated the services response to their 15 previous recommendations on co complaints handling uh, as 10 achieved, three in progress, 
uh, with two outstanding. And those two recommendations are being taken forward by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, uh, Service Improvement Board. Gordon Linders. I thank the Lord Advocate for that answer. The report was, as he will know, critical of Crown Office for its failure to notify victims of decisions not to prosecute uh, and described the COP's approach to notifying decisions as being, and I quote, less inclusive than in other parts of the UK where all victims are usually notified. Um, does his commitment to implement the recommendations uh, today mean that the rules will be changed so that victims are always notified when cases are not prosecuted or will victims continue to be left in the dark? Lord Advocate. Uh, proactive notification occurs in all solemn cases and in all summary cases within the services via remit and also certain other summary cases. In other summary cases, the decision is not proactively notified, uh, but will be advised to victims or, or their representatives on inquiry. The inspectorate's recommendation was that the service should work towards a system of notifying all victims of decisions not to prosecute, whether through the use of IT solutions or otherwise, and I have accepted that recommendation. The service will now explore possible approaches to the notification of all victims of decisions not to prosecute, including uh, possible IT solutions. Question number six, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to build residential accommodation at the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service National Training Centre at Campus Lang. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, decisions on such issues are, of course, operational uh, matters for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I understand that, in fact, there is no current business case for the development of residential accommodation at the National Training Centre in Campus Lang. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service approach is rather to invest in training facilities around Scotland to enable firefighters to be trained nearer to home, reducing, therefore, the requirement for travel and overnight stays at Campus Lang or other locations. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you for that. In March 2015, the SFRS closed the Scottish Fire Services College at Gullen, moving training to Cambus Lang in order to save £4.8 million per annum. Can the Minister advise me if she believes that the lack of accommodation at Cambus Lang Centre and the resultant use of hotels to house trainees has delivered the expected savings, or does she share my concern that annual running costs may now exceed the amount it would have cost to keep the Gullen Fire Services College open? Minister. Well, the, the, the member may be interested to note that, in fact, there is currently a major building project underway at Newbridge uh, in Edinburgh to provide enhanced training facilities in the East Delivery area. And next year, another major construction project at Port Lethen in Aberdeen uh, will provide enhanced training facilities in the North Delivery area. So the member will be aware, therefore, that uh, a number of uh, investments are indeed being made uh, in training uh, closer to where uh, firefighters are. The service has also just launched a new training unit at Kirkwall Airport in Orkney. And as I said in my first answer, well, I see that Jackson Carlo is laughing, but actually for the members of Lee MacArthur's constituency, that would probably be quite a, a good thing. But finally, I would say, finally, I would say, uh, well, yes, Edinburgh and Gullen is not exactly uh, that far apart. Through the chair, finally, please. Through the chair. Finally, I would say, uh, presiding officer, uh, that, uh, as I said in my first answer, that the, the focus is on investment uh, facilities, training facilities uh, around Scotland, uh, and therefore the business case for uh, any particular accommodation at Cambus Lang simply does not represent value for money. And of course, if the member is concerned about resources for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, perhaps she would join with me in calling on her UK government to pay back the £50 million in yeah. VAT yes. that the UK government has deprived frontline firefighters of over the last five years. Thank, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures the local community of Cambus Lang benefit from the Attendees Act and location of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service National Training Centre. Minister. Uh, well, I can say to the member that the Scottish Fire and Re Rescue Service, in line with uh, Scottish Minister's expectations, considers uh, the importance of small and medium-sized enterprises and the inclusion of community benefits within all of its procurement 
exercises. And of course, with the National Training Centre being uh, uh, situated at Canvas Lang, that is supported, of course, by various local businesses, for example, in providing catering to the many excellent events and conferences which take place uh, in uh, Canvas Lang. So I think the member can be assured that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, well understands the need to ensure that the local community benefits also from the National Training Centre being in Canvas Lang. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions.